Hello students, welcome back to my class. Today we are going to study a prose piece, A Pilgrimage to Tawang. This prose piece is written by Berrier Holwyn Elwin, who was a British national, but later on he adopted Indian citizenship and remained in India till his death. He came to India in 1927 as a missionary to serve the Christian mission over here. But his experience in India made him highly impressed with its diverse cultural life and particularly he was impressed with the tribal life and its variety. He travelled extensively from west to east to northeast and central India, where the tribal concentration is highest. After leaving behind his missionary work, he served these tribal people and he became an expert on the tribal life and a tribal activist. He also married two times from among the tribal and he got closely associated with the life of the tribal for which after independence of India he was appointed as the advisor to the governor of NEFA, Northeast Frontier Agency which later became known as Arunachal Pradesh. And for his lifelong service to the cause of these tribals, he was awarded Padma Bhushan in 1961 and for his writing about the tribal life, he was conferred Sahitya Academy in English. He wrote around 34 books on different tribes of India. And this writing is taken from the tribal world of Verrier Elwin. And it is also a part of the ninth chapter of that book titled From Travels in the Nefa Highlands. At the very beginning of his, this essay, we find that he is situating Tawang, one of the most significant monasteries of Buddhism in India, from its geopolitical significance. He is telling about Tawang that it is a great monastery in a beautiful upland valley and in a corner between Bhutan and Tibet. So its strategic location between two independent small nations in Indian northeast border makes it highly strategic and significant. Secondly, its importance is that Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of Tibet who fled his country under the pressure of Chinese government, he came to India on the way of this Tawang monastery. And thirdly, is situating that Tawang also witnessed 
the incursion of the Chinese troops in 1962 for a few weeks and the joint resistance of the Lamaj and Indian military repulsed those Chinese intruders in 1962. So from that point of view, Taiwan was attracting the international attention in that period. And he visited Taiwan with his second wife, Lila, who herself was from Arunachal Pradesh. And this is his second visit. And he is traveling there just in the reverse way in which Dalai Lama entered into India. He travelled through Tawang to Tezpur before being received by the Indian government. And here, Elwin is travelling with Lila from Tezpur towards Tawang. And he is describing how this travel is very significant because he is travelling there with a purpose of visiting the Tawang Monastery on the auspicious occasion of 2500th birth anniversary of Buddha. So they started from Tezpur and they travelled by the motor vehicle, a jeep and they entered into the beautiful countryside and he is describing with an ecstatic spirit. There is the past beauty of the countryside, the distant mountains white with snow, the nearer hills dressed in pine, oak and fir, the smell of the pines, the waterfalls and streams, the banks carpeted with wild strawberries the great displays of rhododendrons and a score of other multicolored flowers. So, as a traveler, he is overwhelmed with the natural beauty of this countryside. And he is describing that as you descend, there are flowers. If there is a paradise in Nefa, this is it. This is it. This is it. It is in the imitation of the famous utterance of Amir Khusru, the great poet of the Mughal period, who wrote about Kashmir. If there is paradise, this is it. This is it. This is it. So, Elwin is borrowing those lines from Khusru in describing the natural beauty of this part of the world, Nepal. And he reaches Bomdila. It is a valley which is very beautiful and he is talking that it is around 8,000 feet above the sea level and there we bought a dress suitable for our pilgrimage. I had a brown silk shirt and a long dark coat to the ankles with a red sash and a fine fur hat. Lila had a red shirt, a black coat, an apron decorated with gay brocade, ornamental boots, and a charming, brilliantly colored little hat which was perched on the side of her head. So, both of them now they are suitably decorating themselves with the dress that is for traveling in this part of the world which is 
in tune with the locality and his feeling she looked enchanting so elwin is very liberal in appreciating not only the natural beauty of nepha but also beauty of lila from bomdila they were escorted by their friends rs nag who was then a political officer and a young anthropologist sachin roy and they traveled through the bewitchingly beautiful land where he came across mompa houses which are substantial two story stone buildings and here they are perched picturesquely on a number of small hills between which runs a lovely little stream of crystal clear water there are several buddhist temples and other buildings so it was extremely scenic and beautiful place every part of it made elwin wonder that such beauty is possible and he also came across prayer wheels and green stones worked by water the great prayer wheels like the flags fluttering in the bridge repeat endlessly the sacred words so the prayer wheels of the buddhist religion they were being moved by the flow of the water and this flow of the water making these wheels move and create a sound in unison which sounds like the sacred words of buddhism om mani padme hum and in the middle of the village there is an imposing old fort jong and above it there is a temple and their camp was arranged in the temple and in the night they slept there at the feet of a large life size image of buddha at the statue at the feet of the statue of buddha and elwin is feeling as if it is a very rare sacred experience to be there in the company of the god where you could put up your camp bed and sleep under the gentle and compassionate gaze of the statues in buddhism religion is not a thing apart from life so buddhism accepts that life is not apart from religion it is a part of it so that close proximity with the images of buddha in their camp made him feel spiritual it is like a pilgrimage real pilgrimage then at dirang valley they met the abbot of tawang who happened to be staying there on his way to his monastery the abbot the high priest he was traveling to tawang and they met him but what is that impression he was extremely impressed by this abbot and his personality and he's telling this abbot is one of the few real saints that one may meet in a lifetime looking at him the phrase the beauty of holiness came into my mind so the very presence of this person the abbot of tawang made him realize as if he is the incarnation of the real saint he is the real saint in its essence the beauty of holiness gentle courteous simple luminous with inner joy he is a completely charming personality and every time i met him i felt the better for it so that was again another illuminating experience for elwin and then they found that in dirang valley 
which was which is populated by the Mompa tribes. Just before every village, the villagers came with their lamas, their children, all dressed in bright and beautiful clothes, which were woven by them. And with some music, they received Elwin, his wife, as guests. And that was also one of the very refreshing and exciting aspect of their travel. That in every village, they were received like very important people, very sacred people. And they were garlanded, they were offered the white scarves, which was the customary reception on the part of these tribal people. And everywhere they were accommodated in some tents covered with flowers. And they were offered the food and drink. And he is praising the Mumpa people. These Mumpa people are singularly courteous, gentle and friendly. He is telling that he has come across very rare people like the Mumpaj, who are so courteous, gentle and friendly. They take up their hats and holding them between their hands, make a little bow at every word you speak. When someone is speaking to them, every moment they will be taking their hats and bowing down before you. They still in some places put on their tongues by way of greeting. And in my whole tour, I never heard a child crying and I do not remember hearing a single angry word. So this is the praise of Halloween for Mumpa people. Not a single angry word was uttered by anywhere, any Mumpa people. If not even he heard the crying of the children. So how cultured, how refined, how courteous, how gentle these people are. He is wondering. And from the Dirang, they continued their journey to more beautiful mountains, the snow clad peaks and they went to Senjedong where the Dalai Lama halted on his journey. We had a wonderful reception on a broad plateau under the towering Sela mountains. So they went to this Senjedong Valley, which is in Sela Mountains. It is some 14,000 feet high. And there he experienced some wonderful natural phenomenon. What was that? In that place, in that snow clad place, he experienced the rain. Rain it did both on our way up and our way back. But though we couldn't see the distant views, it was a memorable climb. And then they got to the other side of the Sela Pass. And there he is describing about his experiences at different heights of 12,000 feet, 10,000 feet above sea level. And as we drew near Tawang, the prior and some of the senior monks in their splendid robes and impressive hats of yellow cloth came three miles out to meet us. So he is describing very beautifully that how these people are so courteous. Even the Prior and other priests of Tawang, they came to meet him some three miles before Tawang. The following day, May the 24th, Buddha Purnima, 2008, 
2500th anniversary of birth of the Buddha, we visited the monastery. So he's expressing a sense of fulfillment that we entered into this monastery on a very, very auspicious occasion, 2500th anniversary of Buddha. We were met at the entrance of the monastery by the prayer and other monks, scarves were exchanged, trumpets were blown and we walked slowly through a fantastic medley of buildings into the great courtyard and he is describing very particularly each and every aspect of Tawang monastery, its architecture, its atmosphere, its inhabitants, its treasure, everything. He is talking about the monastery by telling that it is an ardent devotion of Mahayana type of Buddhism with strong tantric elements. As we know that Buddhism was divided into Mahayana and Hinayana after the death of Buddha. So, this Tawang monastery is following the Mahayana sect and its principles which is having some tantric elements, fantastic images of demons, dignified images of great saints and rimpos, scrolls, etc. all were there. He is narrating each and everything very particularly, which tradition decrees should always be illuminated by artificial light, a rich and somber magnificence. So, he is finding magnificence everywhere and he is finding that on that auspicious occasion, how the whole temple was decorated with some remarkable pictures made on the ground with colored butter. There were also a thousand little Buddhas made of butter round the walls. So, it was decorated with colored butter and thousands of small Buddhas were made from the butter around the walls. And it was also being decorated with 2500 lamps, which was creating a magic splendor around the monastery. Later we went to the very fine library <coughs> whose great treasure is the Gwetampa. <coughs> Eight large volumes, three of which are lettered in gold. And then very exclusively he is praising the library of Tawang. He is telling that this library is a great treasure trove where he came across Getompa, the holy book of Buddhism, where out of eight large volumes, three volumes are written in gold, lettered in gold. There were also copies of other main Buddhist scriptures, some printed and some handwritten. And he is also describing that how the printing there, they were having printing machines these were the machines carved by hand and the letters were quite big. The pages were even bigger and these letters were fixed and they were printed by the hand. Therefore, he is telling this may not sound very much, but a monastic book is a real book about the size of half a dozen ordinary books of this careless modern world. He is comparing the books printed in the modern machinery, modern printing books and the books in this monastery. He is telling these books are the real books. Why? Because any book is having the size of half a dozen of modern careless books. Why careless? Because here everything is very carefully arranged. 
The lamas have a great reverence for knowledge even though many of them are not themselves learned. Every temple has its sacred books which are carried in procession round the village on fist stage. And he is particularly emphasizing on how these people are respecting the books and how these books are also substituting the gods in the procession on the occasion. The most moving of these was the Thuto Dam, the dance of the king and queen of death, which reminds the spectators that death how its every man and they must not therefore be too much attached to worldly existence. And on that day, there was a procession, procession of so many things, so many articles, so many presentations. But he was mostly attracted towards the dance of Thuto Dam, the dance of the king and queen of death, which is representing the mortality of man. Because Buddha's main principle of philosophy was based on this mortality. How to overcome mortality by making the life meaningful, by giving up the desire. So, it reminds the spectators that death how it's every man and they must not therefore too much attached to worldly existence. Then he is making a comparison between the monastery, its library with that of the renowned universities of Oxford and Cambridge because he himself was both a student and a faculty in the University of Oxford and Cambridge. The monastery awoke nostalgic memories of Oxford or even for I am a broad minded person of Cambridge. There was the same casual atmosphere which conceals so much of dignity and protocol. He is telling that these monasteries in the matters of knowledge, sharing, learning, it is giving an atmosphere of Oxford and Cambridge where everything looks casual but it is concealing the dignity and protocol under it. There was the dignified common room where the leading lamas met to decide monastic policy and affairs. There was a great kitchen. I especially noticed the enormous teapots, big teapots, which was serving hundreds of people at a time, where the lamas make their butter tea. But again, he is coming back to the books because he was himself a great lover of the book. Printing was a laborious business. Books here are in the shape of long, narrow rectangles and every page carved separately on the wooden blocks. This pilgrimage, as I have always called it, meant something much more to me than the ordinary official tour. I had always been interested in Buddhism and inspired by much of its teaching. Now it became real to me. So he is telling, in this tour, Though this was named as official tour, but really it was a pilgrimage. Because in this tour, I came very close to Buddhism. From his experiences at every village, finding the temples, the monast small monasteries, the prayer wheels, and how people are living, these tribal people, they are living with religion without any difference, without any constraint. They are living very seamlessly, life and religion moving very seamlessly on their part. Therefore, he is calling this as a pilgrimage. And within him, there was an awakening of spirituality in the true sense. And the few weeks brought a definite change in my life, a step forward in spiritual realization. So he is acknowledging the spiritual realization that he felt during this tour. 
so this is a typical travel log describing the land describing the people describing their habits describing their religion and everything but at the same time he is also not without humor he is creating the humor and he is also pointing out towards some of the practices of these people in the dirang valley traveling through these momba villages he came across certain practices where the strangers were given the drinks the butter tea an alarming concoction of tea salt and butter and raise them one by one first to my lips and to my wife's and then to the rest of the company in strict order of precedence i myself usually only touch the cup with my lips for i found the smell of upon rancid butter overwhelming though he couldn't appreciate the smell of rancid butter but he had to touch it with his lips which is equal to accepting and after the tea they were also offered in the villages rice spirit one of the strongest drinks you can get rather like vodka so this is a very strong drink and they have to accept it and according to the tradition the young girls they have to feed the drink to the guest and in one place he is mentioning that because there was lila so how in place of young girls he was often offered the older ladies to offer him drinks so in this way he is creating some humor and he is also mentioning about some of the practices that may be looked down upon by the civilized world but he is not doing that he is appreciating that that was their way of life and most importantly we will find that this travel log is written in a very simple language and it is moving like a fluid and every now and then he is praising the beauty particularly over the sela pass they came across two lakes a twin lake which is known as eyes of the god so the nature in this part the people their customs and the monastery together they had a spiritual impression on very ralwin so a pilgrimage to tawang is in its essence a pilgrimage for Elwin towards Buddhism. So this is a beautiful travel log, having all the constituents of a travel log, travel writing. I hope you will be able to answer your questions. Thank you.